Tash Dile and welcome to the episode of In Conversation with Tibet TV. This is Sakina Bhatt. Today I have a very special guest. She has contributed greatly in the development of the Tibetan society through various positions she held throughout her life. Her remarkable work in Tibet's literary and culture has made her an invaluable asset, not just to the Central Tibetan Administration, but to the entire Tibetan community. Today I am honored to introduce you to a uh, multi-talented and uh, writer par excellence, Namgye Lamuthakla. Welcome to the show, Namgela. It's very nice to have you here today. Thank you. So Namgela, you have worked in various fields, holding various positions in the Tibetan community, uh, but it also turns out that you had this huge interest in the Tibetan traditional attires and costumes. So how did that happen? I didn't have that particular interest earlier. What happened was um, when uh, Hollywood made the movie Kundun on His Holiness Dalai Lama's life, then they asked me to be the technical advisor. So at that time, we had to research on His Holiness's um, all aspects of his life from Taxi to Lhasa to China, India. And then, of course, costumes became a very important uh, part of the project. I mean, it was a whole, the whole research on a whole uh, technical of what was required in the rooms, in the ceremonies, and the also the um, processions when his owners went from one palace to the other and so on. And then through that, uh, I had to research on the costumes and jewelry. So that's how it actually happened. I just landed up with the costumes and jewelry interests after the movie Kundun. Okay, uh, so you have even worked in this movie uh, Kundun in 1997. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in your book, you even mentioned that you personally strung all the jewelries worn by the character who was playing the mother of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Right. So how was your experience like working as the technical advisor for the movie Kundun? It was a Martin, Martin Scorsese, Scorsese, right? Scorsese's movie. So how right. was your experience working with him? Well, it was, it was entirely a different world, working in Hollywood. And then the film was um, filmed in Morocco in a desert place, and they had to make all the palaces, everything there. And Martin Scorsese is one of the living legends of directors in Hollywood. It was, it was just sort of very stressful. I mean, I had a lot of um, posts that I had to do, look after, the hair, the costume, the, even the makeup. And uh, I had to advise them. And then, of course, the room, uh, room decoration, uh, costume, everything, the ceremony. So it was, it was really stressful. And I was young, and I, I was happy to do it. And being His Holiness Dalai Lama's, um, his biography, I felt it was a, a special, you know, sort of an honor to be selected. And I, I loved working uh, there. And then when it got too stressful, because what happens is the, like the costume designer or the hairstyle, the, uh, the top persons, they would say, we'd like to do something different. For instance, they wanted to do, make the, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's father have a Ngakpa hairstyle okay. and then have a beautiful sort of a silver amulet put on. I said, you can't do that because we are trying to make this movie as tech, you know, technically correct as the history of Tibet. So you cannot do this. And he said, well, you know, who are you? I'm the artistic, uh, uh, I'm, I'm the top of all the, you know, designing. And he said, we have an, something called artistic license. I can do what I want. Mm -hmm. So then I just had to fight him. I said, I'm sorry, because uh, what am I called here for? To keep it as authentic as possible. So then when it got very stressful, I go into my little small uh, room, office, mm -hmm. and then I strung all those, uh, Jewelry, which just sort of, you know, was wonderful. I, I enjoyed it so much, and the stress was all gone. <laughs> so what do you think about uh, today's trend in Tibetan fashion among women, where you see the women uh, donning an amalgamation of modern and traditional uh, Tibetan jewelry and apparel? I think that's fine. That's okay. We have to move. Nothing is permanent, and change is, is the only permanent. But don't you think so that these changes will lead to the disappearance of the Tibetan actual traditional culture? No, I don't think so, because if we keep our traditional uh, costumes and jewelries at um, 
ceremonies, festivals, and wear this as much as we, we can. But every day you don't have to, I don't think so. I mean, you have to be very, uh, go with the change, but it's important to preserve the old. Okay, similarly, like um, back in Tibet, most of the Tibetans, they used to wear the traditional outfit almost every day, and also like uh, on all the occasions. But these days, like we see ourselves donning the Tibetan traditional outfit only during festivals and on certain occasions. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Well, in Tibet, in the olden days, we didn't have much of a choice, did we? Because we didn't know anything outside of the outside world. And then we had no uh, uh, very many uh, different materials coming into Tibet. So now with so much consumerism and so much influx of designer clothes and different styles, and, and I think it's inevitable, we just cannot also say you cannot wear those clothes. All the women in CTA, they wear their uh, chubas during work. So do you think that this is a good way? I think that's a very good way. It's very important because when I was there in 1980s, I don't remember, I was from Minsika, I was transferred as Secretary Health. Mm -hmm. And I remember a particular lady, a senior lady, she came in skirts. Mm -hmm. And um, so I told her, I'm sorry, I said, I'm sorry, I think, you know, we older people, we should not come in uh, Western clothes um, while we're working. When we're at CTA, we are representing Tibetan people, our culture, so we should wear our Tibetan costume. But outside, you're free to wear what you want. We, we are representing the Tibetan people, our culture, our tradition. So the ladies should wear Tibetan dress. And I know they say, why should the ladies wear and the men don't wear? But I do understand the men's clothes is so bulky and then so doing that kupsu and that, you know, that pleat at the back, so complicating. So I guess. So recently you have written this book on Tibetan costumes and jewelries, and it took you 15 years to complete the yes. book. So uh, you must have done a lot of research and interviews to make the book a credible work on Tibetan culture. So uh, yeah. how did you persevere through these 15 years of making of this incredibly powerful book? Well, what really happened was uh, I retired from CTA in 2000. Mm -hmm. And I went to do uh, social work at the Dibungyamgu Monastery because the head lama, Dibungyamgu Chisan Rinpoche, is my younger brother. And when I went there, uh, I had actually started work on this uh, costume and jewelry book. Kyung Gurubuchi asked me to set up the Sung Tsen Library, a center for Tibetan Himalayan studies. And then I went down to, anyhow, I went down to the British Library and American Congress Library and so, so, so on, India International, and then started the library. And, and then there was the nun, nuns. They said the nuns needed some uh, reorganization there in the nunnery and some proper education. So I was looking after the nuns' education and empowerment. Mm -hmm. One day, I was in my room getting these papers together, and then Rinpoche came to visit me. He said, what are you doing, Ajala? So I said, uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put these in order and I'd like to now uh, forward it to the Tibetan library in Dharamsala or Noblinka, mm -hmm. because I just feel I cannot have the time to do this here in uh, Deridun. Then he said, no, Ajala, that you cannot do, because I know uh, these places, their staff are so busy, they might have a volunteer from the West come and do it, they know nothing, and then it won't be authentic. It, it, so you have to do it in your spare time and try to find the time, mm -hmm. and then it'll be more uh, meaningful. So I said, fine, I will do it. So that's why it took so long, also 15 years, besides all the other work I was doing. And um, so that's how it really began my work from there, sort of doing it slowly, slowly. To make it as authentic as possible, what research did you do for the book? Well, most important, I met so many older Tibetans. And the older Tibetans, uh, some of them said, oh, we wore these costumes, but we don't even know the names, we don't know, we just wore it. But there were many who came to know. So I met a lot of older people, recorded their uh, talks, 
And then there's very little written on Tibetan costumes and jewelry. There were no records. So it was very difficult to find records. But there was like um, Amdo scholar Gindu Chimbu, he had written a little bit in, in some article. Then there was uh, Tungar Rinpoche, he had written an article. And then there was uh, Jibun Kyamgu Rinpoche had written a book on the Tunghwang Tibetan emperors. And then uh, Hugh Richardson, uh, he was a scholar on Tibet, so he wrote an article in uh, Tibetan Review years ago. And with him, there was another lady, Professor Heather Stodart, who was the head of the Tibetan language department in Sobon. So she had written an article also in the early times, costumes in Tibetan Review. So I tried to get all that. And there was an Amdo uh, lady who had written about the Qingba, the felt. So I studied all those and then interviewing all the old peop older people, especially my parents, they were living in Dehradun. So my father, Dundunam Gyatsarong, was an old official from the Tibetan government. He was a very quiet person and he was a photographer. He used to work in, he used to take pictures and also, you know, develop them and then... So did his photographs help you? Yes, very much. And not only that, he was able to give me all the information on the uh, costumes of the government officials because he's worn them also. And then my mother had worn all the Lhasa jewelry so now the names of the jewelry have disappeared. I wanted to be sure that is correct. So I looked up the Chimu, the great dictionary of Tibet. And then I noticed my father, some spellings were not accurate. So I took it from there. So the Nature Oracle's costume, also my father knew everything, every detail, because he was so much interested in Nature and so with him and then the Chimola here, who was very young in Tibet, anyhow, with their information, but was rechecked with the, the senior Kusho Wangela from Nichung Monastery. How excited are you about the launch tomorrow? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's good it's going to be a launch, but I, I don't, now I've learned not to get excited over anything. Okay, uh, so Namgela, what is uh, a culture? Is it like fluid or fixed? Culture, culture I mean, is... Like how do you define Tibetan culture and the importance of its preservation? Well, I think we have our culture tradition from the old times. We should try and keep it as much as we can. For instance, like the costumes, we have the Tibetan government uh, costumes called Ringen. They're very elaborate. And those costumes were, and jewelry were kept in the Potala um, treasury. And there was another costume called Geluche. And all this, they wear it, even the old days, they wore it at a particular ceremonies. They didn't wear it all the time. Oh, all so days. they had like particular traditional outfit for a particular ceremony? Yes, yes. These were the uh, costumes from uh, the Tibetan emperors. Okay. And of course, it wasn't worn all the time. I mean, it changed, the costumes changed. So where are the costumes now? Is well, China there? destroyed everything, so I don't know what, what happened. Some said many, many, precious items belonging to the monasteries, to even our government, to the uh, private families. They, many were sold in Hong Kong. And many were just destroyed, just burned. You know? I mean, people didn't know. Everything, old cultural revolution, all just bad, you know. Disown it. We have to go forward. And, and, and I think it's so sad because China lost a lot of tradition and culture at that time too during that period, they didn't realize it. But that was the sad thing, China had a great culture and tradition. We try to keep, keep the old traditions as much as we can. So it's like in the book that I wrote, I tried to have as many old pictures before Chinese occupation, so that people will see, oh, what did they wear? What kind of clothes? What kind of jewelry? Exactly. Right? So Namgela, finally, like, do you have any words or advice to the new generation of Tibetans who stand at a very important crossroad in Tibetan history? Well, I think it's very important that these days we get so lost in, in our social media. I mean, we will go on in this world in, as the world is going, but we should prioritize what is important for us. And I think for the younger Tibetans, uh, it's very important to feel your Tibetans, keep our language and our tradition, 
And then our festivals also mean a lot, a lot to our way of life is something different. And then of course, as Sordens always says, be kind, be you know, compassionate. And I think that we had, and I think these are very important that we should keep. Okay, Namgela, thank you so much for being here and giving us your time. It's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you so much for watching and see you in our very next episode of In Conversation with Tibet TV.